What is this message of the cross? What is this message? What is the word of the cross? What is the gospel? And you might find it hard to believe, but this was the hardest part of my sermon to, to think about, to come up with, because there was so many scriptures coming to mind. <laughs> I had a hard time weeding them out. You should see my other notebook. It's just like two pages, just so many scriptures on it. I, can't, I don't know if I could fit anything else on it. And I had to go through. I'm like, I can't use all these references when I say, what is the gospel? i got to narrow it down. So I narrowed it down to tons and tons and tons to seven. I think seven's a good number. What is the message of the cross? In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, we see that the message of the cross is that Satan himself is defeated. The great enemy of God is defeated on the cross. And the people of God are delivered from the domain of darkness. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says, Since then the children share in flesh and blood. He himself, that's Christ, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death, through the cross, he might render powerless, he might defeat, he might render powerless, him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Through the cross, Christ rendered the devil powerless. Verse 15, and he might deliver those, it's the people of God, those who believe. He might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Slavery? What kind of slavery? Slavery to the domain of darkness, the authority of darkness. That's in Colossians 1, 13. He delivered us. Christ delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Satan is defeated. We're delivered from the domain of darkness. We're transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption. He's purchased us. We have the forgiveness of sins. Isaiah 53, what is the message of the cross? What is the gospel? Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 we see that our sins were placed on Christ. It says this, but he, Christ, this was written 700 years before Christ walked on the earth. He, Christ, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord, here's the gospel, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. When you hear that, do you hear the power of God? Do you hear the wisdom of God? Do you hear the love of God? The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Not only have our sins been placed on Christ, but Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He, God the Father, made Him Christ. He made Him. God the Father made Christ who knew no sin. He was holy. He was sinless. He knew no sin. God made Him to be sin on our behalf. Get this that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
through the power of the cross. Because he became sin by his grace, through faith, we become the righteousness of God in him. If that's not good news, I don't know what is, folks. Ephesians chapter 1. What is the gospel? I already mentioned this from Colossians 1, but we have redemption, we have forgiveness by His grace. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption. Get this, through blood. <laughs> you see the cross? We have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. Amen. Yeah, lavished upon us. The riches of His grace which He lavished upon us in Him through His blood. Redemption, the forgiveness of sin. That's the gospel. That's the message we preach. That's the word of the cross. I can't stop there. Not only do we have forgiveness, but we have justification. That is where we stand. We have a right standing with God. We can stand before God face to face, not condemned because we're justified by His grace through faith in Him who died. Acts 13, 38 and 39. It says this. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, through him, him who died, Christ, that through him, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed. That means justified. Everyone who believes is freed, is justified. Freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. You could not be justified through trying to accomplish all the right things. You could not be justified by trying to do what is good in the eyes of God. What are the good works that he's called us to? He's called us to believe. That's the good works that he's called us to. The foundation of every good work is belief. The foundation of every good work is faith. Apart from faith, all things are sin, the scripture says. But in faith, we have redemption. In faith, we are justified through him who died on the cross. Hallelujah. Yeah. This is good news. This is good news. This is the good news. It's called the gospel. This isn't a gospel. This is the gospel. This is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. The power of God. The gospel. This is the good news. And we're the only ones that have it, folks. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. We see that we have reconciliation with God through the cross. Colossians 1, 19 says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness of deity to dwell in Him, to dwell in Christ. This is the incarnation. This is God in the flesh. This is Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man right here. It was the Father's good pleasure that all the fullness of deity would dwell in Christ, the man Jesus Christ. And verse 20, through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. We have peace with God. We have reconciliation with God 
through the blood of his cross. This is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. And finally, in Ephesians 2, we see that not only do we have reconciliation with God, but we have reconciliation with our fellow man. And in this passage in Ephesians 2, it's talking in the context of the, the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the Greeks, which is good because our text in 1 Corinthians 1 talks about the Jews and the Greeks. And we see here how God, through His cross, reconciles these people who are divided. Ephesians 2.13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, that's talking about the Gentiles, the Greeks, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, both the Jews and the Greeks, He made both groups into one, and He broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in His flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, that in Himself He might make the two, the Jews and the Greeks, into one new man, thus establishing peace. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. He came and preached peace to the Gentiles and peace to the Jews. Verse 18. For through him we both, Jews and Greeks, for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. I want you to see in verse 18 the work of every person of the Trinity in our salvation, in our reconciliation. Through him, that's Christ. We both have our access in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, to the Father. That's God the Father. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all working together in unity to accomplish the salvation of man, which is our access to the Father through Him who died on a cross. Jesus came to die, folks. Jesus came to die. His whole purpose in becoming flesh, in humbling himself, in obeying God's word, resisting every temptation to sin, and all he was tempted in every way, even as we are, yet without sin. He endured all that. He endured our mockery. He endured all that He endured. I could go on and on and on. To die for our sins. That we might be reconciled to God through Him taking the wrath due us because of our sin upon Himself and placing His righteousness in us so that we could be freed, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be justified, so that we could be reconciled to God, reconciled with our fellow man, so that we together as the church can praise Him and give Him the glory due His name. He came to die. He came to accomplish life in those who are dead, those who are being saved, those who are the called, our text says. 
His whole purpose was to die. That's why when Jesus was going to the River Jordan where John the Baptist was there baptizing, and he was baptizing person after person after person after person, and all of a sudden John the Baptist looks up and he sees Jesus Christ, his cousin, walking towards him. And what does John the Baptist say? This is the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. What does John the Baptist say in John 1, 29? He says, behold, that means look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what he proclaimed being. He didn't say, behold, there's my cousin. <laughs> cousin Jesus. Yeah. There's my cousin Jesus, my buddy. He's coming to get baptized. No. He didn't say, behold, the miracle worker who's going to turn water into wine. He didn't say, behold, look, there's the physician. He's going to heal the sick people. He didn't say that. He didn't say, behold, there's the wisest financial advisor who's going to teach us how to steward our money well so that it would benefit us and others the most. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, he didn't say behold, look, there's the humanitarian who's going to feed the hungry people. He didn't say, behold, there's the wonderful counselor who's going to teach us to walk according to the golden rule. And he didn't even say, behold, the creator of the universe. Who's going to calm the sea. No. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was all those things, for sure, and more. And he did all those things, and he did more. But if he did all those things, but he wasn't the Lamb of God who died on a cross and bore our sins and gave us his righteousness, if he didn't die on that cross, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins and alienated strangers to God. Come on. His miracles are great. His care for the poor is great. His healing of the sick is great. His leading, his teaching, his sovereign rule over creation, that's all great and wonderful. But there's nothing like his death on the cross. We preach Christ crucified. This channel exists to help you follow Christ more faithfully. Like and subscribe.